do. Um, rather, rather than take questions, I'd like to bring the panel in because I think it's probably best to get all the views out, just given what I've heard. Uh, <laughs> so uh, why don't we start at the end, Kirsty, then David, then Ravi. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Kirsty Hamilton, I'm an Associate Fellow at Chatham House. I've been working on the Renewable Energy Finance Project since 2003, but I'm also now working with the Low Carbon Finance Group, which is somewhat of a spin-off um, for my work for me, but it involves a group of uh, finance practitioners who have a common uh, interest in actively investing in renewable energy. So they are deploying capital. They are people that have been involved in project finance um, for a number of years and uh, specialised funds, many of whom raise finance from institutional investors and some of the institutional investor uh, advisors. And um, the first piece of uh, collective policy we engaged with was EMR, which I have to say has been a bit of a baptism by fire because, of course, well, I'm a policy person and, in fact, my first work on climate and energy policy was back, started in 1990 in New Zealand, where they were implementing the British model of power sector deregulation. We called it electricity sector reform, which is a, a nice difference from electricity market reform, of course. Um, but uh, it meant that what we policy people do is uh, stamina, and I think that's a, it's a very different model if you're used to doing deals. You know, you don't tend to, you go into a meeting and uh, when you go back to the next meeting, things look a bit different. And I think in the policy world, um, we, have a, we have a different approach, we have a different uh, communication style, and things have a different currency, if you like. Um, so what I thought, would be le I thought was less interesting in my remaining three minutes was to talk about the detail of what the financier see is important. But if we reflect upon the fact that a, a major part of the EMR objective was attracting capital or moving capital into UK energy generation and infrastructure. And the word infrastructure, of course, is a slightly complicated word in one way because policy people use infrastructure in one way and financiers sometimes use it in a different way. So we just need to be aware of that difference uh, without discussing it. But of course that was, that was a major part of EMR was about bringing in new entrants which included independent generators and institutional investors. So quite different um, uh, uh, characteristics of what those entities will look for. Um, but I think I really wanted to say, if you were to, to look at EMR as a microcosm of things that will be more relevant elsewhere, I think there would be two or three points that I would emphasise just based on that two-year process of involvement. And none of these are a criticism of DEC, because DEC inherited four bullet points from a coalition negotiating process, and they have really done their best, and I think finally producing something that with a lot further battering at the blacksmiths can turn into something that will work. But um, uh, what I want to say is that, first of all, the sis ener electricity system approach is absolutely central. Most financiers who are doing renewables are not looking at the tariff issue alone. In fact, the set of issues that we're still looking at that will be in secondary legislation were on the table at the primary analysis of the first uh, consultation. So the first consultation, if you remember, looked at fixed fit versus premium versus CFDs and what financiers were saying back there is what we look at are these following things. That means that you've got to line it all up, including route to market, including a set of other uh, of other issues. So systems approach absolutely vital. And in a way, and again, this is not a sort of a, like being aware that Ravi's on the panel, but it would have been ideal to have the energy efficiency strategy and the gas strategy. Um, uh, they are at the outset along with um, a, a set of, uh, along with the objectives that were built in. What are the conditions to attract capital? I think there's just two things to say without going into the detail of the bill and the legislation. One is political confidence and stability, and the other is detail and precision. And actually, they're like two bits of bread in a sandwich, so we've had a lot of focus on the meat, peculiarly enough, or the tofu if you're a vegetarian. But actually, political confidence is the biggest issue on the table for investors at the moment. So the unedifying fight between Treasury and deck, which I think... You know, is it a fight? I don't know. A negotiation, whatever diplomatic term you look. That is very difficult if you have credit committees in a different country and they're ringing up. I had someone ringing me up who's based in the US and saying, uh, 
what's going on. And then for us, as policy people, we can do interpretation of that. But if you're a financier, that interpretation that gives you confidence to essentially bet your house on the policy, that's more complicated. The precision point is, I think, another really important issue. And it makes it look like decarbonisation is dealing with a tiny little set of things. It is, because the damage gets done to the risk profile of the policy, which is what the financiers are interested in, at quite acute granular detail. And unless you're in there working with DEC, which is what Low Carbon Finance's group, not to, here's our position, but you know, do you know how it looks? And it looks a bit different to banks, it looks a bit different to funds, etc. So that detail, the precision of how it all lines up, the package, not just the CFD, but the detail underneath that, that's really important. And that creates a challenge for all of us who are not financiers. Because we don't, it's not just do you know their vocabulary, it's do you know how people ask and answer questions. And as someone who's been in that at that level, that is a really interesting. And there's no reason why policymakers should know about finance. Um, uh, what's making things complex? I'll just, I'll just, this is my, my last point really. Be thankfully to know. I think I've probably got about one and a half minutes left. Um, I think you've used up. Yeah, no, it's like somebody <laughs> else's but one and a half minutes. Handily <laughs> enough, I don't have a second hand in my watch. I think what also, what's making things complex, I've made the politics point, but there's another issue, and, it, and it's complex, but I think we shouldn't be afraid of this, but we do need to unpick it, and we haven't properly yet. And that is the lumpy intersection between greenhouse gas driven policy and energy and infrastructure policy. I think those don't line up just by putting a decarbonisation, and this is not about the bill, by the way, but they don't, that's why we're having a discussion earlier about carbon price versus, what does carbon price do? It certainly doesn't provide renewables investors with the platform of things that they need to make the UK a more attractive to drive scale and that intersection is quite complex and needs unpicked and I think together we need to do that rather than pretending it's not complicated because I think it is. I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. Yes. <laughs> David. David, if you would. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll speak from here too. Um, I'm speaking from Imperial College, but I'm also on the Ofgem authority, so I brought along a piece of paper saying we welcome the bill, just in case uh, <laughs> when, 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 when uh, Ravi issues his uh, strategy statement, it all got misinterpreted. Um, there's a lot more that came out there, and I've written down here, thank God for Leveson. Before I came here yesterday, <clears throat> I went through 32 blogs of various commentators on the energy scene. I've never seen more red herrings in my life. You could form a common agricultural policy on this intellectual pulp. Right? <laughs> Why do you not do that? On Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we're trying to persuade investors that we actually have a secure way of thinking about things. On Thursdays and Fridays, people are pouring out essays that wouldn't get sent back. They get torn up by, by Jim Ski's course. I don't know what you think is going on in this mush that we're calling this at the moment. Leveson has shut all that down because I just checked, there's no doubt you have to, and actually the energy bill is dead news on the major news channels. Thank God for that. Now we can have a proper debate. Bits that are missing, for example, if you downloaded the whole bloody thing, was the energy security report. Right? I, that did surprise me about Chatham House, of all people, because it's not as if you hadn't been in the gas business big time. It's not as if the Ofgem report on gas security that went to there, which is now on the website, which some of your ex-Chatham House colleagues contributed to, isn't bloody scary. There's a map here with a bit called the Middle East. I don't know whether Chatham House have lost track of that, but it's weird. Your LNG tankers are chuntering through the Suez Canal at the moment. I was talking to my Egyptian colleague uh, just before I came here. He's a couple of doors down in the, my corridor. And he said, it's getting tough out there, right? They are just burning things. So it's jolly good. Um, and also, we already know, if you look at the, um, at the capacity limits, over the next three or four years, we're actually very, very thin because the um, large combustion plant directive, which I naively negotiated back in 88, <laughs> uh, largely assuming that somebody would do something about these dirty plants before, <laughs> no, are actually going to cut in like no tomorrow in 2030. It's all written in there. Um, the Secretary of State for Energy desperately tries to tell the country that maybe we need to do things. 
I'm right there, and I'm not sure whether Lord Rees was an instrumental thing, I'd like to think some, some of the rest of us were, right there next to the bill is a really big consultation on demand management. Never seen that before in deck. Thank bloody Christ, the Energy Efficiency Deployment Office has arrived. Right? We were heading, and I think this, is, this was probably Chris's point, we were heading towards the most expensive green policy money could buy. So it's all green upstream and dirty brown downstream. Quite extraordinary. Most people abroad had no idea what we thought we were doing. Right? It's, what, what's the going rate? I know Chris might have a lower figure, but my going rate is 3,000 quid a kilowatt for a nuclear power station base load. Right? You take it to the FM contract here and say, take out base load, and I'm giving you 3,000, what, three quid a watt. Yeah? It'd have it overnight. In fact, I've gone around working out how I do it. Okay. And fortunately, somewhere in the consultation is maybe we don't know how to do it. Maybe another too complicated thing to do. But at least trying to get the demand side to have a sight of the capacity management. Otherwise, we, lucky punters, because uh, we are, after all, the demand side, are going to be spending a fortune propping up a demand side we can't do. Um, the, so I think that's tremendous, right? Okay, and I'm really hoping that you know people think rather than keep drawing on their blogs in trying to help de get through this sort of issue. Because um, uh, if we are moving into a period in which we are no longer energy independent in a serious sort of way, we're accidentally buying stuff from people who don't want to buy Burberry raincoats; they just want to buy the whole Regent Street. Yeah? And we haven't really thought our way through the macroeconomics at all, and you can't rely on Treasury to do anything, as we noticed from 2008 onwards. I mean, they don't fully understand things. The last point I wanted to make, because this is a very mild intervention, really, um, <laughs> was that somebody did mention the rebound effect, and it's partly because we have a very weird way, particularly in the UK, of trying to implement energy efficiency by sending out cost signals. Whether anyone seriously believes I'm going to make more tea if you force me to have a more efficient kettle, I have no idea. Right? Okay. <laughs> but broadly speaking, there, there is a very big problem that isn't addressed anywhere in the documents, because I, I can understand why. But on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we are seriously addressing a demand problem when we don't have capital investment in the main screen. And Thursdays and Fridays, some weird people in the cabinet office are inventing deregulation of initiatives and counts and tick boxes, which are screwing things up. Any of you who've ever come past a display energy certificate, you know those things universities hide a bit, which says that some of their posh low energy buildings have turned out to be Fs and Gs. You'd be glad to know DCLG's um, 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 new bright idea of, of of uh, deregulation is you won't have to renew them except every 10 years. Right? This was came out from ministers only a few days ago. So I think there's an issue about let's help DEC get the whole holistic package together. I, I've done climate change for 26 years and I knew you a lot would all do it very well so I haven't addressed that bit at all. There's a massive security problem the country's got to get its tiny mind around. Okay? It's got a massive sense of trying to get our demand side in a way in which we actually get the thing effective as well as efficient. And in my last bit, uh, let's give a little bit of, of muscle to deck and to the yeah. Scottish Welsh Americans and the rest of it to give a push. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi the, the aim was not to sort of just pile all of these comments on top of you, but take your time. Uh, I, we, <laughs> at least, so, so I'll, I'll wave my fingers if I get too, too okay, concerned, fine. but off you go. Um, well, my name's Ravi Gurumurthy and I'm the Director of Strategy at DEC, and I also have to manage communications in DEC, so I too have been looking at these blogs, and I agree with you completely. Um, <laughs> I first started working in this field in, in 2006 um, and was quite involved in the creation of the Climate Change Act. And I do think the energy bill is probably the third significant thing we've seen since then. The Climate Change Act was the first one because it set a, a long-term institutional framework that really locked in political ambition and created some institutions like the CCC that have played a crucial role in that. And the second was the creation of DEC and the integration of energy and climate change policy. Uh, which I think has had a huge effect on policy making in Whitehall. I think the energy bill will probably be seen as a third significant reform, um, and, and particularly for its ability to institutionalise um, a set of policy objectives and choices for the long term. Many countries are going through a really similar set of challenges to us, old infrastructure, um, the need to diversify and move towards more low carbon sources, but also real concerns from the public about 
cost and particular choices of technology. I think what we've done reasonably well is not take a knee-jerk response to those public concerns and developed a framework that I think will potentially be durable. And that was something that I think we were really, really keen to do. Will this stand the test of time over 10, 20 years? And in making it durable, we wanted, to, wanted it to be uh, providing the certainty that investors need, the confidence, but not be so static and um, inflexible that it becomes brittle and, and, and it is easy to unravel if there are changes in the external context, technology failures, costs that fail to come down, or different um, administrations politically. Um, and I think one of the, the things that I feel we've got quite right in this framework is the balance between flexibility um, and stability and certainty for, for investors. Um, I think what we've announced in the last week um, has really responded to quite a few deep concerns that people have had um, who are trying to invest against this framework. And I think, uh, I would say DEC has been quite good at really engaging in the detail uh, of, um, of, 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 of people's concerns. Um, I'm very grateful for the uh, awfulness of the transport infrastructure that you managed to read about our proposals for energy infrastructure. And as you'll see, um, one of the things that we've changed is really crucial, which is about the counterparty body um, for investing in um, feeding tariffs with contracts for difference. And as everyone will know, that was not the proposal originally, and we've changed that hugely in response to uh, people's concerns about whether this is deliverable. Um, so that's the first thing, which was a huge um, battle, because as you can imagine, government being the counterparty body to major contracts is not something that uh, the Treasury not automatically were uh, pleased with. Um, the, the, the second uh, big thing is, uh, is funding. So what we've got agreed with with the Treasury is that the funding for renewables and low carbon electricity will go from £2.4 billion a year today to £7.6 billion in real terms um, by 2020. So that means we do actually have the funding for the first time to say we can go from 11% of electricity being renewable now to 30%. So it also allows us to, to be in the position where I think the main constraint on getting to 30% will probably not be financial. It will be, it will be build rates and other barriers. And, and that really, I do think, is, is significant. I know people wanted more in terms of clarity on the 2030 side. Uh, and the decarbonisation target. What we do have is a, an agreement that there will be a decarbonisation target in 2016 and a power that we'll, we'll take out in the energy bill. But also, I think really importantly in the near term, uh, we will be providing guidance to National Grid um, about what we think is a least cost um, pathway. And we will be able to say why early decarbonisation of the power sector is actually the right course. So. You, you, can't, you can't provide complete certainty, but I think eight years of funding and clarity about um, the, the longer-term pathway uh, is, is a pretty good deal. I just want to say one final thing about, sort of, about energy efficiency. Um, if you look at our 2050 scenarios, you, you look at the carbon plan that we published last December, all of our pathways to 2050 involve a per capita energy demand reduction that is really significant between a third and a half and the, the most cost-effective pathways tend to be around a 50% reduction in per capita energy demand. We're doing quite a lot in the short term uh, on energy efficiency. So if you take our price and bill impacts assessment up to 2020, the energy efficiency savings are set to outweigh the price increases from renewables. And that's because you've got things like 12 million condensing boilers being forced on in regulations up to 2020. Uh, you've got you know, three and a half million uh, cavities and loft installations as a result of regulation of companies, uh, energy companies, by 2020. You've got a whole set of European standards on lighting, fridges, freezers, TVs, which all add up to quite significant bill savings. It's not enough, and we know that if you look at the 50% per capita demand reduction, what drives it are uh, two or three big things, really. One, um, the electrification of heating. Uh, two, the electrification of transport. Um, and, 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 and thirdly, a whole set of smaller um, changes around appliances. But what I think that shows about in the, the 2050 scenarios is that, is that even though you have a big per capita energy demand reduction, you have quite a significant electricity capacity increase. 
um, between 30% and 100%, uh, depending on how much bioenergy you use. So I completely agree that we need to do more on energy demand reduction, um, but in all scenarios, given economic growth, demographic growth, and electrification, we need to build a lot more electricity capacity, and that's why I think this electricity market reform proposal um, is necessary and, and actually will test the, stand the test of time. Thank you. Uh, um. Left. I'm going to take so, hands up anybody who wants to, because I'm going to take two or three questions. There's one over here. Is there a second or third? If you want to direct it to uh, a particular person, please feel free to do so. Well, it's uh, whoever, whoever wants to um, ask it. Um, uh, as somebody who's been an enthusiastic contributor to the blogging mush that has been uh, so roundly condemned, that's, uh, fair enough, I, I, I do a lot of outcoming. So. Um, uh, I, I, I'm afraid I'm still extremely cynical about this, and my um, two questions are trying to uh, push through this cynicism, I suppose, if you want to put it negatively. Um, first, um, although, yes, I recognise we've got this counterparty in the um, bill, which, you know, I mean, car needs wheels, and it wouldn't have had any wheels unless it had that. Um, I not sure that that is a tremendous, um, uh, a fantastic thing, but um, uh, al although it needed to be done. But the two key things are, firstly, um, how is, isn't this renewables program just going to end up as a reduced version of the current renewables obligation? Because a lot of companies, I mean, I, I'm afraid I haven't read the latest draft, so maybe you can uh, correct me, but a lot of companies big companies that do schemes that are not the big six won't be able to access these CFDs, which will automatically cut out, won't they? Uh, a lot of the capacity that, ha that is currently uh, coming forward. And secondly, my, my, my second question is, although you may have these nominal big amounts for spending in this levy control framework, is it not also the case that the Treasury will have to agree to the strike prices? And it's only with the right strike prices that you're likely um, to get significant renewable development. So we really don't know whether we've got even as big as renewable, even half as big as renewables program until these strike prices are, are announced. Thank you. Um, I take one more question. I think it was directed at Ravi, wasn't it? But I mean, others can comment. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to take one. And the, the lady over here, I think, was first, and then uh, the gentleman next to her. Hi. Um, my name's Ros Donald, and I work for a blog called The Carbon Brief. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, sort of campaigning around the 2030 decarbonisation target for the electricity sector. And I was wondering whether the panellists could tell me how significant or otherwise they think the fact that it wasn't incorporated is. Thank you. And, uh... <coughs> My name is Nigel Haig. In the session before tea, we had an explanation of how fracking was changing the situation in the United States in a big way. Uh, how might it change the situation in Britain? Okay, excellent. Three questions. I think the first one to Ravi. Um, okay. Okay. If, if you would. Okay, yeah. would. Um, so, first of all, on renewables, um, the renewables obligation will stay in place until 2017. So there is no immediate switch over to contracts for difference. And the banding proposals are published for those uh, sectors up to 2017. I agree that there, is a, there are questions about liquidity in the market and the available, availability of power purchase agreements, which I think is something we recognise, uh, and Ofgem are doing quite a lot of work on to bring forward proposals on liquidity. Um, but CFD should be and will be open to, uh, sh should enable access to, uh, f for all players. And I think one of the big focuses of, uh, of this reform is to try and get new entrants into the market, because we do not believe that the big six have the balance sheets to be able to shoulder the burden of investment required up to 2020. Um, just on the levy control framework, um, the way it will work is next year we will set out the strike prices um, for the period 2014 to 2018. Um, that will be 
derived from the £7.6 billion envelope. Um, so uh, that envelope does give us the guarantee that we can uh, optimise within that. I, I should, that was the main fight. Treasury are very keen to not have to sign off every single investment decision and uh, price that we put in place. Uh, they, they said, look, you manage the trade-offs, we'll give you an overall envelope. And I think that's a much better place to be than us having to negotiate on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Uh Jim, do you want to... Yeah, yeah if, if, I, if, I take, if I take the 2030 target, and obviously declare as a member of the Committee on Climate Change, we were rather enthusiastic about having such an intensity target for 2030. Just to kind of frame it, uh, you know, the, the way the Climate Change Act framework works, there are carbon budgets that are set, and the argument has been that the carbon budgets are there, they will provide the framework for it. Carbon budgets do not infect investment decisions. Uh, carbon budgets provide a discipline for government in putting policies in place. And then you need more specific policy instruments that you're going to actually affect what investors do. And the situation we have at the moment, we basically have a carbon budget that runs out to 2027, but we only have firm commitments on renewables delivery out to 2020. And I think that was one of the arguments to get more, more linkage between the, the, the timetables there. And I guess the concern has been not that uh, you know, people are not going to come forward with investment in the period up to 2020. The confidence is about the supply chain for renewables, etc. beyond that period, the confidence to build up that industrial capability. So I think that was the reason for being enthusiastic about it. If we wait till 2016, there will be really quite a short time horizon in which there's absolute certainty you know, about what, what the policy framework is. Nick, you wanted to comment? Yeah, uh, David as well. Two, and I'll pick up Kirsty's point, which I think is that um, it has sandwich investor sandwich analogy which is you know, that I work a lot with overseas investors and um, they do look for certainty before they look at the detail, they look at big certainty in politics and strategic intent and unfortunately the row over the 2030 target and the lack of it, if we'd had one and not a row, there'd be much more people looking at the detail of the bill and the mechanisms and that's just truth because that, there's a two step or three or four step process actually, so that was a mistake and that time was missed and it's a shame it wasn't pushed forward um, alongside the importance of setting certainty of supply chains and investors in the short term and medium term, it's also for me constitutionally incredibly important that the levy control framework doesn't set the ambition of clean energy in the country when Parliament has legislated to a carbon budget. And that discussion shouldn't happen between Treasury and DEC in a budget setting process. It should happen out in public in Parliament between our elected representatives. So one thing connected a decarbonisation target to the Climate Change Act and the advice of the Climate Change Committee in the long term, for an enduring framework, does. It basically says if the two numbers don't add up, and there's lots of reasons they might not, including costs, yeah, steel prices going up and lots of other things, the fight will not be an in-house budget fight, as somebody who's been in them, they're not very edifying, but there will be a clear space for Parliament to decide whether it wants to increase the money going to deck so it can meet the targets Parliament has set and agreed, or not. <coughs> But that is the right place for it to happen. So I think it's really important, again, to kind of have this mechanism to have the flexibility to roll forward, that that connection is there. And I'm really pleased the power will be in the act and, um, you know, eventually we'll, we'll get a target. Because otherwise, um, again, there's just... The Treasury has this habit of putting little bombs in legislation on climate change reviews in 2014 and 2015, which are actually materially don't get them anything except increasing uncertainty and causing problems. And it would be just nice to kind of clear some of these out of the way so we can get on with it which is what everybody else wants to Everybody wants to get on with doing this, not constantly fight over whether we should be doing it. Thank you. David and then Kirsty, uh, and very briefly. I, I, I think political certainty is an oxymoron. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> By the time you have a nuclear power station up and running, you will have gone through two general elections. I couldn't find out during the small break what UKIP's policy was on nuclear, but for all I bloody know, they could be setting it, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a sense, it seems to me, that the policy should look like it hangs together, which was my criticism of the blogs, because they don't, right? That the sense in which, when you read through it, it has a compelling logic that relates to it, is a thing that, in the end, the investors know that they think they understand where on earth you're coming from in the midst of the noise. We all seem to have investors who are friends. My one seem to be Qataris, who I find rather ambiguous in their attitude to this whole process. Um, so I, I, I'm not so sure about that. I personally, in the area I work in, the actual the 2030 and the 2050 targets have been positively unhelpful. They have actually skewed the development of technology. They've crushed out 
interim short-term things that we could have done on saving energy in real buildings because people have suddenly said, and I think the CCC infamously said to local authorities, you better not have district heating, even if it's efficient, because it might be running on gas and you have to look at your gas bill. What a silly thing to say, right? Okay? No one else is saying that. So I think there's a sort of sense in which, as long as it's logically compelling, and this is up to you, comms, I'm guessing, to do it, right? As long as it's logically compelling, I think investors understand where it's coming from. And the last teeny bit I go with is I still don't think I have seen the logically compelling story between fracking. I've had an awful lot of people who've bet their own farm on the future of fracking, some of them in very high places saying how cheap this is, but mysteriously, I can't find how much it costs, right? And it mysteriously looks like an awful lot of people aren't taking rent at the present prices, and that this looks as ephemeral as almost anything else in block sphere. So I think, you know, there's a sort of sense of trying to work through the logic of this. But for some investors, it looks very, very odd. One page of a piece of paper says, gosh, there's gas all over the place. And on Fridays, there's no gas at all because we've shut down the 2030 network and the rest of it. And I think a little bit more compelling logic, which I looked to Jim Ski for, not me, um, would actually, I think, produce this certainly. There's great chunks of stuff in the energy bill which really do have a compelling logic. You can see how the bloody thing will work. Yeah. Okay. Kirsty, a brief comment. Yeah, uh, so I think um, on the investor side, the thing is that everyone's an investor now, aren't they? I mean, who do you know that isn't calling themselves an investor? But the people that I work with on the finance side, I think there was a very strong feeling they didn't want further delays in the bill. Mm. And so when they were asked at the select committee, they were saying, don't delay the bill on the basis of getting a final decision on the decarbonisation target because we've had two years of uncertainty. If it, if it slips beyond next year, a lot of complication in the market. So I think that was it. Not that decarbonisation wouldn't be a good idea. Second brief point is, it gets to the point I said about the intersection between GHG and um, energy policy. Is it a decarbonisation, you know, it could be a decarbonisation target, it could be a renewables target. There's a whole debate to be had about strategically about what you need at present. And we're going to see it at its brutal best in Europe starting next year as they throw up the debate about the Renewables Directive, Efficiency Directive, ETS, um, versus British government have already said we'd rather have a low carbon target. thing with low carbon or uh, decarbonisation you have to interpret it into the underlying thing that you want done. So what you must do is not add complexity by having that. So I'm just saying that's a debate to be had, and I think we'll all be involved in it, and I'm not sure what the right answer is at the moment. Thank you. Um, last question. What is the potential for unconventional gas through fracking in the UK? Anybody have a view on that? Um, anybody out there have a view on that? Okay, make a comment. Well, and there's one over here, so two, I mean, two the UK comments. The potential is rather small. I mean, the, the impact on the UK, first of all, there are huge uncertainties, and I hope yeah, I yeah, said yeah. that, as David mm. said. We don't know. And the gas price shot up in the last two weeks. The impact at the moment is indirect. I mean, the Qataris built terminals to supply the US. Last year, we got 28% of our gas from Qatar, up from zero three years ago. That's an incredible change. And it's having big impacts on the gas situation in Russia, who thought they had a captive market in, in Europe. It may all change because it's uncertain. But the effects on the UK are going to be indirect. Thank you. As a comment, thanks. Um, so I, I, I would echo the caution about um, unconventional gas uh, in the UK. And we clearly have some. Uh, it's unclear how much, and above all, it's unclear how much it would cost to extract it. Uh, in the US, gas prices went down to below $2 per thousand cubic feet, just in case anybody's not following blow by blow, and that may include some who are pushing changes to the, uh, to the, to the bill. Um, that is already now uh, 360, 380. So it's already doubled uh, this year in the US, and the producers are still losing money. So we think that it, in the US, it costs about $5, possibly uh, a little bit less, a little bit more, to make money out of shale. In the US, 
you have a lot of it, low population densities, lots of people's with, people with rigs, fragmented regulation, etc., etc. So if it's five in the US, then it's probably going to be eight dollars in the UK. Uh, and it'll be eight, by the way, if you import it from the US as well, which is essentially what gas costs now. Uh, and then finally, uh, if you, uh, it's highly unlikely that the Brits are going to, if they don't want a wind farm next to their house and they don't want a homeless hostel and they don't want uh, a shopping centre and they don't want any new housing, they're going to love having a fracking operation. Um, which leaves us probably depending on imports from Qatar, from Australia, from Nigeria, etc. in tough competition with Europeans who are shutting down their nuclear plants, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, etc. and also in tough competition with Asia, because most of those providers can choose whether to export left or right. And the prices in Asia, it really behooves us to remember, are currently 16 to 18 dollars per thousand cubic feet and not the eight that we have in Europe or the five or four uh, that we've got in the US. And so I think when we read things like Dieter Helm's piece in the FT today, say, oh, the risk mm. of, of being exposed to high cost renewables uh, when everybody else is going to get this yummy, cheap uh, uh, shale gas, I think he's got it entirely. Um, the wrong way around. I think it's Winston Churchill. I think he's killed the wrong pig. And the chances are, if we depend on gas, we're going to be exposed to the high gas prices. Thank you, Michael. I, well, we, we are at just beyond six o'clock, and I've got to get you out of the room. Uh, there's a little time for summary. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, that there may be a representative in the room, the European Commission, for actually funding the dissemination of this work within Europe. So thank you for, to the sponsor, as they say. And uh, I think it's been a very interesting afternoon. Let, let me just, just make two or three points that stick in my head. First of all, the, the conventional wisdom view, almost whether it's the IEA, we've heard other views, is that this long-lived, high-inertia, high-habit system, which we call the energy system, is going to continue to some extent the way it is much longer than most people envisage. I think what Global Energy Assessment is saying, if you hold strong views as to what should be the objectives of the system, then you've got to look for change. And it provides, I believe, both the policies, the system solutions, the approaches which are worthy of debate for those who want <coughs> to change the world and bring about something which is rather different from the world we're in, which puts a genuine value both on the planet, a genuine value on the by products of the energy system, which are being a very significant cost. If you want to read more, the book is there. I'd like to thank very much the panel. Invigorating uh, afternoon, very exciting. Thank you all for coming. Okay.